The Liquid Culture. What's up, everybody? Mitchell Chirac here again with you today from the Liquid Culture. We have got another episode in the Eight Wines You Should Be Drinking series that I've been working on. Uh, it's the second to last episode and a really, really cool one. I've got some beautiful, beautiful wines to show you guys here today. Uh, we're talking all about German wines that are not named Riesling. Everybody's very, very familiar with Riesling. Everybody's heard of Riesling before, whether they like it, whether they hate it, whether they love it. Um, people are very familiar with that grape varietal, and most people know that it comes uh, from Germany. It's a very uh, widely planted, very popular grape varietal in Germany, as well as in Austria and Alsace. Um, but the wines I want to cover with you today, guys, are wines from Germany that are not Riesling because Germany has so much more to offer the world uh, than just their Rieslings, which are phenomenal. Uh, don't get me wrong. You should also be seeking out German Rieslings as well, especially as food pairing wines, really, really exceptional food pairing wines. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about some of the underknown grapes and underknown styles of wine that come out of Germany as well. So. Um, um, you guys all probably know I live here in Fredericksburg. I moved here um, from Dallas. Uh, well, it's been it's been a, over a year and a half now um, that we've been living here. Um, and one of the things, yes, we do have an exceptional Texas wine industry here, uh, kind of surrounding the, the city of Fredericksburg, but one of the things that a lot of people really know Fredericksburg well for is the German history and the German culture that's here in the city of Fredericksburg. And uh, there, th what that's done is really kind of expanded my uh, mind and expanded my ideas of what German wine is outside of Riesling. Um, we have a, a, the local wine shop here that uh, you guys probably know that I consult for, La Bergerie, and we carry some excellent German and Austrian and Alsatian wines in there, um, all kind of run through this kind of similar vein, uh, those two countries in that particular region in France. Um, and then the same uh, the same family owns a, a German restaurant next door, kind of an upscale modern modern German bistro uh, here in town called Otto's. And that was really where I started to um, kind of open up my cache of understanding of what German wines could be and, uh, and, and what they really are outside of the world of Riesling. Um, a lot of really, really beautiful wines, both red, white, and even some really, really interesting rosé. Um, so I've got some wines here today, guys, uh, from a really kind of a a buzzy kind of producer. So I just wanted to utilize um, this lineup of wines. I, I, I kind of make it a little bit of a producer highlight, sure, um, but really they just offer a really excellent lineup of wines that are all different um, from Riesling that, that allow me to show you guys what I'm after today. So again, Germany is a really, really exceptional uh, wine growing country. It's cool climate, lots of steep vineyard sites, really exceptional soils that are much, much different from soils that you might find in a lot of other parts of the world. Um, the, the, uh, well, let me tell you a little bit about the producer first. So Ender and Mole. Uh, this is a uh, producer that we've just recently been bringing into La Bergerie and into Autos. Um, but they're, like I said, they're a very kind of buzzy uh, kind of producer. They're almost kind of like, they're, they're somewhat considered part of that minimalist winemaking scene, but they don't, they don't try and pin themselves into any sort of dogma. They just try and be as, as, as kind of laid back and hands off as possible with the wines. But for some of their red wines, they're using new oak. Um, they're doing some filtration. They're doing some SO2, uh, just depending on what they get from their wines. And I think, it, to me, that's excellent. I, I don't think that any one winemaker should be sticking to one sort of dogma just because you know, that's what people want necessarily. Uh, do what you have to do to make your wines exceptional. And that's what they're doing at Enderl and Mole. They've been making wine since 2007. They're really well known for their Pinot Noir which we have one today. But what I wanted to start with, guys, is their Mueller Turgau. So Mueller Turgau is a, uh, a very, you know, kind of well-known and heavily planted uh, grape varietal in Germany. Um, 
it's it's a cross uh, between two uh, different grapes, one of which is Riesling, um, but it can it can it can be good. It can also be kind of bulk wine production um, type of a grape. Uh, but to me, the ones that are really good are, are really, really good indeed. Um, I've never had this particular wine before. It does come uh, from, from some relatively old vineyard sites in Baden. So in Germany, we're in the, the sub-region or the region in Germany called Baden, which is actually right across the Rhine River from France, from Alsace. So just a step across. So you're going to see a lot of similarities in um, kind of terroir and grape varietals that are used, um, but still some pretty good differences as well. So right down there on the southern, the southwestern tip, of Germany right up against France and Switzerland. So guys, this, this Mueller Turgau, it spent a couple of days on skins and then eight to nine months on the lees. So we've talked about that before, lees aging. Uh, really adds a nice creamy, supple mouthfeel to, uh, to a white wine. But one of the other cool things they did with this was is that they took some of those skins that were left over after fermentation, threw them back in during the aging process. So what I can expect with this wine is something that's probably going to be very bright and lively and crisp since it comes from a cool climate, but without lacking any sort of mouthfeel and texture because of the winemaking process that um, went into making this particular bottle. On the nose, this smells a lot like Chardonnay to me, um, which is really interesting. It's got that lime, it's got that where Chardonnay can almost go uh, when it gets really nice and ripe, it can go that kind of peachy tropical fruit route. But then there's a little bit of like um, like a, a, a floral character as well. I wouldn't say so much grassy like Sauvignon Blanc, but definitely kind of white flower and honeysuckle um, type of characteristics coming out of here as well. All around a really interesting nose. There's even a little kind of beeswax, little waxy um, honey kind of uh, characteristic on the nose as well. So not, not crazy high acid like Riesling, um, but again, this is a totally different grape varietal, an earlier ripening, uh, earlier ripening grape varietal. Um, so not crazy high acid. I would say the acid's probably about medium. Um, it's, it's funny. It's almost like it's a lightweight wine, but it has a lot of flavorful punch and a lot of, like I said, texture, very textural on the palate. Um, there's a little hint of detectable tannin, which is uh, not common with white wine. Um, and it's very creamy and smooth and it, it, it lingers on your palate. So even though it's very lightweight, it's very like flavorful summer wine to me. Like it's very light on the palate, but it hangs around and, and does not sacrifice flavor at all. Yeah, it, it almost kind of tastes like Chardonnay too. It has that lemony, um, lemony, kiwi, peachy um, kind of thing going on. No buttery characteristic, but definitely still smooth. Very smooth from that lees aging. Really, really tasty wine. Honestly, it's not, you, you know, a wine for really this time of year, in my opinion. This is a really excellent summer sipper right here. Um, nice light package, but plenty of flavor. Up next, guys, uh, a personal, personal favorite uh, of mine. This is the Weissengrau from Enderlin Mole. So this is a wine I've had many bottles of since we brought it in um, to Fredericksburg, to La Bergerie, and to Autos. Um, this is an orange wine, um, but it's not an ultra funky orange wine. I, I, we did an episode on orange wine a couple episodes back. Um, Talking about that, you know, process. If you're if you need to know more about how orange wines made, go back 
and watch the uh, the orange wine episode that I just did a few weeks ago. Um, but orange wines can be kind of funky sometimes. They can be really tannic at times. They need a decanting. Um, what I love so much about this Weissengrau is that it is an orange wine, but it's ultra, ultra approachable. It, if you told, if you handed somebody a glass of this and said, this is a rosé, they would drink it, no problem, wouldn't think twice about it. They wouldn't get all kind of timid, like, I don't know if I'm gonna like this. It, it, it's a beautiful, really easy drinking wine, but for those people who like to geek out on orange wines, if you're looking for it, there is a slight hint of funky character to it. So Weissengrau, why is it called Weissengrau? So uh, in Germany, oftentimes you have different kind of German names for certain grapes that we've all come to, uh, to know. So Pinot Blanc, and Pinot Gris. So Weissburgunder and, uh, and, and Grauburgunder are Pinot Blanc and Pinot Gris in, uh, in, in Germany. So uh, Pinot Gris, you know, kind of Pinot Gray Pinot, uh, it, it's kind of that, you know, on that edge of, is it a white grape, is it a red grape? It's kind of in that gray category, literally. Um, and then Pinot Blanc, uh, it's just a clone of, uh, or, or I'm sorry, a mutation of Pinot Noir. So what was what was done was these two grape varietals were were harvested. They were blended it's about 60-40 vice to growl. Um, and then they were left on their skins for three to four weeks uh, during and after fermentation. And then the wine was uh, racked and put into large oak vats. So it takes on you know, it's not new oak, it's just that, that neutral oak where you get that subtle kind of oxidative aging process that takes place um, without adding any sort of toasty, you know, rich oak characteristic. So yeah, on the nose, I mean, this is just like, it's like strawberries and cream, peaches and cream. It's got a slight, almost like um, wilted rose petal characteristic to it, um, which is almost kind of that funkiness that I was talking about. That It's been hard for me in the past to pinpoint the funky character that's in here. It's not that like barnyard hay funkiness. It's not like Brett funkiness. It's not like animal skin or soil necessarily. I think it might be just a decaying like old dried rose petal type of character. And honestly, I've got them a little cold right now. And the more that this Weissengrau warms up, the more that this wine really starts to, to become expressive on the nose. So where the Mueller Turgau, I think, was a little bit more nose expressive, and, and just kind of a, a one or two dimensional on the palate, which is not a bad thing for what it is. Um, this Weissengrau is, I think, more exciting on the palate than it is on the nose. That kind of straw, I mean, it literally kind of, it, it really kind of tastes like I'm having like a strawberry shortcake with like fresh whipped cream dolloped on top of it and some like edible um, rose petals on the plate as well. Um, really, really full in the mid palate. Very flavorful, very, um, again, very textural. These wines are very textural wines. You can really feel them on the palate. They really linger and hang around for quite some time. There's like cantaloupe in here and uh, some grapefruit. I mean, just, just, I mean, it really runs the gambit of fruits and flavors uh, with this wine. There is a slight kind of buttery, like that shortbread cake, buttery cake um, on the palate with all the fruits, strawberry, peaches, grapefruit, melon. Um, it's all in there with that subtle floral kind of rose petal like, but it, on the palate, it's more fresh rose than it is decaying rose like it is on the nose. I'm telling you, this is a really, really fun wine. Um, if you live in the area, come and find, come, come, come to La Bergerie. We will have, we have this on sale at La Bergerie by the bottle and it's, all of these wines 
are they pack a punch way above their price range. So they're not going to break the bank. Any of these they are all in about that 30 to 40 dollar price range at, at the max. Actually, I even think the vice and grow you can take home off the shelf for uh, around 20. Um, please come seek this wine out. Th th this is a this is a good wine. Don't get me wrong. We're out of it though. So there's nowhere for you to find this. This is an exceptional wine, this Weissengrau, an exceptional wine, probably one of my top 10 favorite wines of all time. And it's like an everyday drinking wine, which is what is so exceptional about it. The Pinot Noir we're about to get to, also available both at La Bergerie and Autos. If you guys live in the area, if you're coming to visit the area, you'll be able to taste these two wines. So, Pinot Noir. Oftentimes in Germany, you'll see it again. Remember, we talk about Germans use a different name for a lot of stuff. Spotburgunder is what you will find Pinot Noir at. So, little fun fact for you guys out there. If you're looking for German Pinot Noir, either on the shelf or at a restaurant, uh, oftentimes will be called Spotburgunder. This is the 2017 Liaison. So, the Pinot Noir Liaison is almost kind of like Enderlin Moles. Um, Premier Cru. So if you're a Burgundy drinker, you know you've got kind of standard Burgundy, you've got village level Burgundy, then you've got Premier Cru Burgundy, and then Grand Cru Burgundy. So, Von, or I was going to say Von Boden, that's the importer. Um, Enderlin Mole has a couple what they consider Grand Cru Pinot Noirs from their terroir. This is kind of like their Premier Cru, just a little level um, below the Grand Cru vineyard sites, and it's actually a mixture of a couple of different vineyard sites, but still from 40 to 50 year old vines, guys. So definitely still old vine category here. Mm. This nose is exceptional. So like I mentioned before, Enderlin Mole has, gets a lot of their reputation from their Pinot Noir production. A lot of people liken it to Burgundy, not because it necessarily tastes like Burgundy, but because it brings that same level of focus and finesse while still being masculine and flavorful and really showcasing terroir. But to me, guys, Sticking my nose in this glass, this smells like Burgundy to me, but it smells like aged Burgundy, like beautiful Premier Grand Cru Burgundy that's got 10 or 15 years on it Burgundy. And you can see in that coat, look at that color. Excellent, I mean, it's, it's kind of hard for you to see, but excellent, excellent color here. Um, you know, nice and light, like if you have, you know, watched my, my Pinot Noir series that I did, pardon me, my Pinot Noir series that I did earlier this year. Um, you know that I talk a lot about when I'm pouring Pinot Noir, I love to see that classic kind of brick colored, you know, translucent, transparent, you know, to a point, uh, red color in my glass. And this absolutely has that. And on the nose, it has all those great, great things that you come to expect from excellent Burgundy, and even more so these days, in my opinion, from some of these excellent Pinot Noir producing areas like Sonoma Coast and like Patagonia, Argentina. Um, really, really beautiful, complex nose. Lots of dried fruits, um, dried strawberries, dried cranberries. There's a soil component to it, a um, kind of a, a gritty dirt kind of uh, sandstone soil, sandalwood kind of quality. So on this Pinot Noir, they they actually source their barrels from Domaine du Jacques in Burgundy, very, very well-known Burgundy producer. So not necessarily new oak on this, but their barrels range from one to five year age. So a slight bit of that kind of sandalwood leather kind of quality coming from the oak, not overpowering spice and pepper and vanilla or anything like that. Um, but just that ever so subtle little hint of French oak aging on this wine. That sandstone, sandstone sandalwood leather character really comes through on the palate. Very savory on the palate, little bit of structure here, some some tannin, not crazy on the acid. Um, I would say medium, medium. 
which you guys know I like to be in that medium, medium spot, right? Um, it could for sure be a food pairing wine here, um, but also a wine that's just very enjoyable on its own. It's got a very fall, whereas these two are kind of almost, uh, I'm going to call this, they're very, we got the seasons here. Summer is here. I think we're, I think we're spring, we're summer, and we're fall. Um, I don't think that we're going to find a winter, uh, a winter representative from Enderlin Mold, just given the cool climate uh, that they're in. But these wines really take on, on the characteristics of a lot of other um, of the other seasons. It's a very fall tasting Pinot Noir to me. Um, a lot of just really rich, um, cozy, cuddly uh, kind of characteristics. You know, very kind of like flannel shirt and fresh cut firewood um, kind of vibes going on with this wine for sure. So guys, that is wines from Germany, not named Riesling. Uh, I love this lineup of wines. I think that what Enderlin Mole brings to the table is spectacular. And I, I highly, highly encourage you guys to go out, seek out other wines from Germany that are not named Riesling. You're probably not going to find them in places like Total Wine, Whole Foods, Specs, um, places like that. You may have to go and support support your local small wine shop, God forbid. Um, you might have to go and find your local wine shop and ask them if they've got any good German wines that aren't Riesling and pick up a bottle of German Riesling while you're there too. Hell, don't leave that out, but try and explore something new from Germany. That's what this whole series of eight wines that you should be drinking is all about. Exploring something that you haven't tried before. If there's ever a time to do it, 2020 is the time. I'm sure at the time that I release this video, we'll all still be waiting on bated breath for election results. And if there's ever been a time to try something different, to take a shot, say, fuck it, man. Like, I'm gonna try something I've never done before. 2020 is the time to do that. I guarantee you, you won't be disappointed. It's gonna spark something in you to get out there and continue trying new things, and it's gonna make your, your life much more exciting and much more lively wine experiences for you guys out there. So as always, Mitchell Chirac here with The Liquid Culture. Thank you so much for watching, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.